everyone so first of all uh, i'm thankful to the uh, sri lanka uh, sri lanka smart energy council for um, taking me as the moderator of this uh, yeah, i hope the, the first ever event of uh, events series of events they are going to uh, uh, conduct and then uh, uh, today we uh, listen to through three uh, very uh, fruitful and very informative timely uh, uh, speeches uh, presentations by, on very timely topics now uh, what i heard from the organizers the sri lanka smart energy council is uh, mainly uh, targeting supplying cleaner reliable and uh, cheap energy to sri lankans in affordable uh, and commercial uh, commercially affordable uh, manner uh, of course they are mainly focusing on this uh, sustainable uh, development goal 7 of uh, united nations where ensure we are ensure access to affordable reliable sustainable and modern energy for all so uh, in this context the modern energy sustainable affordable reliable and modern energy sri lanka energy uh, sri lanka uh, smart energy council is mainly to bring synergy between energy and it to achieve energy sustainability so uh, we heard uh, uh, we listen for three uh, lectures and first uh, one was uh, by uh, professor uh, vijay pal uh, professor vijay pal uh, spoke about smart energy concepts and relevance to the new normal of course uh, he uh, talked about world history um, uh, power plants uh, transmission line networks Um, and uh, so on, and how a, a smart energy network will be built by bringing a computer into this one, and so on. And uh, uh, so, um, and also he was uh, talking about um, uh, in a smart energy uh, system how the intelligent, efficient, and uh, uh, resilient manner how the uh, network can be managed. and he talked about the load load curve with multiple peaks and how a smart energy uh, network can resolve these peaks uh, which are uh, not catered by basically by the green energy and so on so in this uh, session uh, i will uh, i will first ask uh, questions uh, Uh, from um, the speakers uh, and then uh, of course uh, the audience also can pass questions uh, i will uh, first ask from professor vijay pal now uh, professor vijay pal when we get more and more renewable energy to be uh, for the network uh, we all know uh, the renewable energy uh, is not firm they 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 give energy but it is not firm capacity now um, in this context uh, forecasting uh, will be very important and um, i think uh, in sri lanka also a uh, lot of renewable energy is uh, promoted uh, but uh, this forecasting aspect is uh, not much addressed now uh, to best of my knowledge uh, wind forecasting can be done fairly accurately Uh, up to about eighty to eighty-five percent during uh, during wind season uh, because wind is not uh, changing, you know, uh, much against the forecast. Of course, solar uh, solar also can be fairly accurately uh, uh, forecast uh, to about seventy uh, percent. However, the problem is uh, here and there one or two clouds. me can cause some problems um, now uh, under these scenarios uh, it bringing it into uh, this field how do you see because it can uh, play a very prominent role 
in uh, weather forecasting and then data acquisition and then uh, data analytics and then uh, predict now for example if there is a cloud coming this power plant will see that uh, cloud so that uh, that the their data network can always um, uh, inform the other uh, other other power plants okay a cloud is coming and then there can be a, a problem like this and then basically uh, this uh, data analytics can be used in a big manner maybe later on it can go into artificial intelligence and machine learning as well so uh, if you can uh, touch upon this uh, professor uh, jaypal yeah now uh, i little bit uh, disagree on the statement that uh, renewable energy is not firm but you later said that you know wind is uh, firm to some extent for example in the wind season in uh, mana for example where we have the largest power plant so we can predict maybe quite uh, confidently that what will be the available plant capacity maybe today tomorrow next maybe few days based on wind predictions and also by experience that maybe 30 40 50 percent of the plant is uh, plant dispatch is available firmly so that our control center can accordingly plan their generation but when it comes to solar uh, maybe even if we have steady uh, sunlight but uh, solar irradiance but still but still there can be sharp changes due to the presence of clouds even even by uh, not 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 steadily but even in a while you know one cloud can sharply drop it to maybe even to 10 20 percent of the capacity in a, in minutes which might be a issue which might be a issue for the system operator but uh, the techn technology such as image this uh, cloud imaging and uh, other similar technologies can predict the presence of the cloud looking at the cloud speeds and wind speeds etc and uh, predictions are possible predictions are possible but the the issue is even if you predict it even if you predict it sharp catching up with other power plants is a challenging job because you can mobilize single stage uh, gas turbines to match to some extent but you know that as the, at the sacrifice of the the, the the lifetime of the machine you can do it but at a higher cost than the energy cost or whatever you are going to save because gas turbines can do it but end of the day your life that the lifetime will be reduced but the batteries can come in and help if the battery prices come down pump storage also can come in and help yeah and so the combined with the it and the automated operation so because these things cannot be done with human intervention it has to be done automatically so looking at the frequency or whatever the the other para parameters and uh, so i think in the in the coming years with the with the pressure on reducing fossil fuel based power generation due to climate change issues and other things i think the technology has to come in and uh, it is good to see that the prices of pv technologies and uh, are coming down have come down drastically and also on the decrease in the world market maybe not in sri lankan market because of the dollar rupee denomination changes but still they can make sense if we overcome these uh, other challenges and uh, the only help that we can expect is from the, the it and the the digital solutions so that the more our power plants can work to catch up all these intermittency and seasonality issues and uh, whereby we can integrate more and more renewables but then there comes the question dr tilak raised at what cost of course that we keep we should keep in mind therefore we can't rush ahead of other countries to show that we are going to be renewable ahead of them it doesn't make sense because economically we are already doing bad so we must do it cautiously at the right time and uh, while while making sure that our economy is doing well because without if the, the total economy to at a, at a developed stage if we try to do smarter things we will not be that smart uh, why this uh, fixed cost should be added to uh, rooftop solar because rooftop solar is produced uh, at the load center itself 
now for example kalambu uh, demand is very because total solar uh, connected at the moment to best of my knowledge is uh, less than uh, 300 megawatt now kalambu solar and uh, solar coming in uh, maharagama or any other area maybe gampaha so they are producing the load center itself do we need to add that to fixed cost uh, doctor <sighs> well um, it's a relatively simpler way of looking at it because uh, it's you know you need to do a very specific calculation on what is the generation capacity standing by to support solar so solar has to be supported in many ways one is to manage the intermittency the other one is to manage the the variations you know the inevitable night time Uh, zero solar production so of course if there is a battery storage in the in the power plant premises then to deliver solar energy to the customers all what you need is the distribution network so the difficulty is to apportion the cost of the generating system that is standing by as well as because generators are in the in the transmission network the transmission network is also standing by to absorb this solar and make this happen so therefore that's why in a in a relatively simple way i know that you know average cost don't uh, don't represent the true situation right uh, in a relatively simple way I, as i said if wind is not there there is, should be another power plant standing by on its behalf and it has a capacity cost if solar is not there in the night there is another power plant standing by on its behalf so so therefore what is standing by on behalf of renewables would have to be added because the other power plants the hydro power plants as well as the coal power plant they have their capacity cost already built into the built into the total cost so so that's there has to be some rel- relatively simple method so this is the simple method i used of course it is arguable whether it is actually the total fixed cost to be added or a proportion of the fixed cost to be added and what should be the role of battery storage in the future and how much the system capacity standing by can be relieved if battery storage is there so that's how we need to look at uh, as to how uh, how the capacity cost to be costed but having said that our studies indicate that increasingly particularly in the suburban networks uh, rooftop solar actually goes reverse through the transformer into the mv network so we have several Uh, case studies of uh, this happening in the urban networks of course in the suburban as well as rural networks because the solar pv rooftop uh, density is still lower you do not see this happening so in that case of course definitely distribution is locally uh, locally consumed uh, not causing additional losses etc uh, but uh, urban areas this is happening okay uh, thank you no uh, possible ability video I, i said that it was a part of the question now uh, actually um, i will uh, go to the next part now um, with the uh, of course yes uh, this uh, renewable power used to be expensive but uh, with the lay, uh, recent uh, compared in recent in the sense i think last uh, from uh, 20 uh, 26 17 16 17 like it was always competitive bidding so now with the recent uh, tenders now actually wind power goes below uh, 13 rupees actually uh, there are uh, bidders who gave as low as 9 rupees and 50 cents rupee, uh, per uh, kilowatt hour for wind and also solar has now gone with the competitive bid in gone down to about uh, let's say 12 rupees per kilowatt hour actually there are there are a lot of bidders even at the 8 rupees and 50 cents and so on under uh, this uh, um, when we get this uh, the drastical uh, power reduction with the competitive bidding uh, so um, and if we can definitely it will uh, in my view will continue to uh, go like this uh, how uh, can you discuss this Uh, with the um, coal power and natural uh, gas power uh, with the uh, how how you see the synergy or how this uh, matching of this uh, renewable power with lower power, uh, electricity cost 
with the coal power and uh, natural gas certainly the the fact that the renewable energy based electricity generation costs are coming down is is most welcome so we have to realize that uh, most of the renewable energy power plants that are in operation the entire mini hydro fleet as well as the solar parks and the wind wind power plants were all brought in under the feed in tariff regime so feed in tariff uh, for the benefit of those of you who may not be familiar is a fixed price that is offered to anybody which is non negotiable and the agreement is also non negotiable sri lanka started off that arrangement in 1996 so it's 25 years in fact to this year of uh, uh, renewable energy development under feed in tariff so <clears throat> and that's how sri lanka reached almost 12% of contribution from these non conventional renewables or new renewables whatever uh, word you may use to refer to them uh, this kind of contribution was obtained by having a fairly fairly i would say relaxed uh, contractual conditions and a non negotiable contract on the table and a non negotiable price of course uh, to ensure that the so called non negotiable price is attractive to private investors sri lanka had to virtually bend backwards uh, from time to time to uh, to offer attractive tariffs so i do agree that the that the fleet of uh, almost 250 small renewable energy power plants that are in operation are power plants that came in under the feed in tariff regime so as you can imagine feed in tariff regime is a calculated price and that calculation uh, can can be done professionally can also be manipulated i have to tell you right it can be manipulated and when the price goes up it goes up but when the price has to be reduced it doesn't happen so because the industry lobbies are so strong so therefore uh, looking back at it as a person who has been in fact uh, promoting and advocating uh, feed in tariffs when looking back at it i see that uh, owing to the to the weak bureaucracy that we have and the weak governance we have uh, the even uh, i would say a right thinking bureaucrat has not been able to uh, able to bring the prices down once the external environment changes so so therefore most of the renewables that we have are those that came in in that window certainly when these contracts retire then the new project should come on competitive bidding now that's uh, on something on which there is no clear policy direction and finally what i have to say is that rooftop solar pricing again on feed in tariff standard contracts no questions asked no uh, negotiations were determined based on a 10 kilowatt rooftop panel at prices and uh, financing conditions as of 2016 at that time a bank loan was 14% and the capital cost was so much and now with so much of reduction in spite of the rupee depreciation so much of reduction of capital cost attractive bank interest rates which are down to 4% for solar rooftop and the economy of scale enjoyed by larger solar rooftop contracts that has not caused a reduction in the feed in tariff so i'm getting at the difficulty of the government uh, and the decision makers in handling this problem because there is no mechanism so when there is no mechanism there is no annual revision there is no review by the public utilities commission there is no public hearing by the public utilities commission of course there are hearings when the prices have to be increased so when prices have to be increased there is a lot of enthusiasm when customer prices have to be increased as i say there is no enthusiasm finally what we are what we are compromising is the financial viability of the utility which will be felt several years later so if you ask cb now line augmentation expenditure have been stopped so that means if the demand is growing in a particular local area nothing to do with renewables those improvements are not being done because there is no money so a bankrupt utility may be an enjoyable uh, you know dinner time chat for many people but a bankrupt utility means 10 years later 
we will have a very poor transmission and distribution network. Of course, cost reductions in all fronts are possible, including, as I told you, in distribution costs. Uh, now, uh, Professor, uh, now uh, if we uh, if we see uh, the computer uh, industry, um, you know, IT is uh, used in a big manner for uh, for diagnose uh, problems. Now, for example, nowadays a laptop, you get three year warranty. Uh, and then most of the troubleshooting uh, of our laptop, our vendors or the OEM supplier, they do the uh, troubleshooting from their backend, you know, through IT. Mostly uh, they find the fault through the proper analysis and they simply send the um, whatever the uh, item to be replaced only. Now, good old days, you had to uh, send the computer back. Likewise, I think this is uh, very well done in the airline industry where uh, gas turbines are monitored while the flight uh, plane is on the flight, the gas turbines are monitored. Now, um, if the same is applied uh, to our energy sector, we have uh, meter reading, still mostly a meter reader goes to house for meter reading. And when uh, during a pandemic, uh, meter reader cannot go, meter reading cannot be taken. Of course, the consumer uh, then definitely uh, uh, will not uh, pay. He is not getting the bill. Uh, and also if we go, go little move uh, one step up, then we get uh, line tripping, grid substation tripping, generator breakdowns. I mean that uh, uh, network breakdowns. Now, if we digitalize uh, this power network, so much of things uh, can be uh, automated and then uh, diagnostics, data analytics, and later on it can be uh, move on to um, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. And um, so uh, how, can you uh, touch upon uh, your views on the existing system and then the challenges in uh, uh, going into a, a, such a system, benefits and so on? Thank you for that question. I had uh, contemplated covering that, but I figured that my, uh, my time allocation would not permit me to, so I left it out. So if you look at it from uh, a relatively simple, uh, I mean, simplicity of application, uh, I think you were very much on point when you talked about uh, the airlines, uh, which is uh, almost like predictive uh, repairs. So that you uh, look at the equipment, you get a lot of feedback coming in and based on that feedback, and I think you know the, we are talking about enormous amounts of data coming in. Uh, really, it cannot be dealt with without some form of uh, algorithms and repair or replace elements of uh, airline uh, aircraft engines and so on before a problem has manifested itself. Right, so after it breaks down, you then scramble to figure out what it is and repair it. But here, before it breaks down, now the funny thing is, you know, I mean, this is not rocket science. Uh, in a way, uh, I can remember uh, being surprised by my uh, when I was, I had some administrative responsibilities also in the university in the U.S. And you know, we had got some uh, photocopy machines where we were not paying for the machine, but we were paying on a per copy basis. So it had to be connected. It had to be given its own, own phone line and communication links. So the, the guy who sold it could monitor it and get the data and so on. And then one day the secretary comes running to me and says, Prof, you know, they've sent some things to install. So I called this guy and I said, what, what, what is this? Then, you know, our diagnostics have shown that a certain part has to be replaced. And we've sent it and your secretary or you can do it yourself without my, without having a, some technician come all the way, right? So, you know, that's sort of the basic principle, which is before a problem manifests itself or a coal fired turbine goes down, uh, you are able to diagnose it using, this is, you know, this is the sort of the simplest and the most practical application of this 
concept of internet of things. So on one side, you have the sensors all over the place. And on the other side, you have the capability to, to deal with the massive amounts of data that comes in. Now, many of us only think of the sensors, not about the, the ability to analyze it, right? So now the second question is with regard to the grid. I think to a certain extent, we talk about the grid, uh, there is a certain diagnostic capability already built in. I leave it to the engineers to talk in more detail about that. Uh, what I was going was I was sort of jumping beyond that and talking about uh, you know this remote uh, monitoring of all the uh, wind turbines and so on that was that's at the edges of the system so that you could use them more efficiently than in a system where originally your your system is designed for the big plants and these things are sort of bothersome nuisances on the edges of the system, but you design it with the idea that everybody is going to be shutting down uh, and coming on board at various times. And you're doing it through, uh, basically through algorithms or machine learning uh, without too much human decision making coming into the picture because of that complexity that is now uh, part of the system. So I, I do appreciate this opportunity to sort of expand on that little module that I uh, couldn't, uh, uh, that I decided to leave out. Thank you. What is the, 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 the biggest uh, challenge or bottleneck, or rather I would say bottleneck or the network is facing in digitalization? I think compared to what we had our network, what we had uh, maybe 10, 15 years back, by today, we have uh, introduced digitali digitalization as IT and other solutions. For example, now our new system control center can observe most of the, the grid substations and the controls as well. And uh, so the new lines are very well connected and they are, they are operated, even can be operated remotely. And now uh, this uh, OPGW uh, communication network which is running with the Earthwire in the transmission network provides a very good communication, even beyond the required capacities of the CEB for the communication improvements. So, so for the last 10 years, 10, 15 years, we have done very well on this. Of course, uh, not to make it autonomous operation, but, to, but I think uh, the, the maybe in the future expansions, the funds will be the main, main drawback because we are no longer entitled to get soft loans uh, of that, that, uh, that what we could get earlier. And uh, so we will have to self-finance probably. So either the government or the utility, but the utility is not doing financially well. So that might put brakes on uh, going towards this because you can't do things at any cost and then, you know, without uh, earning it somehow. And when the government is also unable to bridge all these financing options, so it will be uh, in the in the coming years for the network expansion as well as for the digitalization and other things. So the the funds will be naturally the funds will be the main issue because ten five to ten years back, government was healthy enough to support and bridge. I remember at one time when the CEB was uh, having a. 50 billion uh, deficit, treasury pumped 50 billion in and uh, shut the, and closed the accounts. And so that uh, CB was again on a uh, healthy balance sheet. But that kind of things, then the treasury is unable to do, the government is unable to do in the future. So the future for the network expansion and all these things, the financing will be a major, major issue as I see. Tilak can okay, add some time. Uh, yeah, quick. Thank you, Professor Vijay Pala. So, sorry, Dr. Simbalapati, you want to tell? Just a quick intervention. Of course, uh, in distribution engineering, distribution network planning, too, I see uh, quite a lot of uh, digitalization. So, almost the entire distribution network is now available on a GIS platform to conduct all required studies in most areas. So, in both LECO and CEB, maybe there are gaps, but still, uh, in terms of uh, asset management, analysis, etc., uh, there is progress. 
but further progress is required in the customer interaction part. So, uh, I mean, personally, I would like to see a situation where a customer does not have to visit any office to get a connection or to get any other standard service done. This is available even in, in Bombay, Maharashtra, even in rural areas, it's available. You can get a connection visiting without visiting any office, as I say, as a slogan. So uh, I don't think we have reached that stage as yet. So there's quite a lot of work uh, yet to be done on the customer service aspects uh, in uh, application of digital technology. Of course, many things have been done. The, the apps are there to inform the outages, uh, take customer complaints. So that side is relatively uh, well progressed uh, in both the utilities, but much more needs to be done. So that's it uh, from me on that question. I just want to alert you, there are some questions or comments under Q&A as well as under chat. So uh, in case you- Yes. Don't... Dr. Siembelevitia, what do you think? What is the bottleneck? Of course, bro, time of data tariff will uh, always uh, be a good point to reduce the peak and uh, to, 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 to go cut the losses. What is the, uh, what is the bottleneck? Uh, time of day tariff, uh, well, we call it time of use tariff. So time of use tariff was introduced as an option for industrial customers starting 1986. So 1986 to 2010, it was an optional tariff. If you like it, you take it. Otherwise, you'll be on the regular flat tariff. In 2011, January, it was made mandatory for medium and large industries. And three years later, it was made mandatory for medium and large uh, commercial customers as well. So uh, if we quickly look at how popular this has been, yes, uh, of course, there is no formal survey uh, on how, what the uptake was, are the customers responding to it? You know, these are studies that, uh, you know, should be done. Uh, are they responding? What is, their, what is their view? Are they shifting the demand? What type of appliances or processes are they shifting from peak to off peak? Um, so uh, that kind of a detailed survey is not there, but my observation through interactions and analysis of a handful of customers is that they are responding to it. They are sensitive to the time of use pricing. They are shifting their equipment. Then of course the question comes in, how about the time of use pricing for retail customers? Not only for households, but for other retail, because don't forget that we have 700,000 small commercial customers. You know, the corner shop, the office, uh, the small supermarket, the post office, all these are in the category of small, small commercial customer. So uh, in my view, yes, we need to bring in the time of use pricing of course, when you bring in time of use pricing, there is a principle that uh, your target customer should have a shiftable demand. So if the customer has no, no type of appliance that he, would, that he can use at different times, then that customer is unlikely to shift. For example, the low, low user households, most of them are using electricity only for lighting and television. And if he does not, of course, if he has a fridge, we are not recommending the fridge to be switched off in the night just to beat the time of use pricing. No, it's not uh, recommended. But then he does not have a demand that can be shifted. So in household, the demand can, that can be shifted are basically appliances, the washing machine, the dishwasher. And uh, washing machine ownership is certainly around 40% uh, now. But the dishwasher is, uh, is not there. People don't have it. So likewise, uh, for households, there will be a limitation. But having said that, even to be sensitive and do the load signing in the off-peak period, which many households do, uh, that level of uh, you know consciousness can be brought in only if we bring the time of use pricing. So, so with the smart meters, I don't know whether it's a fully smart meter, but at least the meter suitable for time of use pricing and programming uh, being available. Uh, in my thinking, we should bring it in. Uh, as soon as possible. Of course, electric vehicle charging goes without saying that uh, should be fitted in there together with some controlled uh, control on at what time they actually do the electric vehicle charging because it's a heavy demand on the distribution network. So uh, the answer to your question is yes for households. Government is pushing for uh, large solar power plants. And uh, then um, but uh, when you have one power plant at one location, a big power plant, if you get a cloud and whatever these intermittency, the impact of the intermittency will be higher. 
So, uh, but if you have distributed like present solar, rooftop solar and so on, the intermittency impact will be uh, very much low. Under such scenario, but why still government is trying to promote large uh, megawatt? What is your view? Uh, it is uh, beneficial uh, against this uh, distributed ones. I can quickly respond, certainly uh, to beat yeah. intermittency and uh, also to get more and more investors involved. My preference always is for smaller, uh, smaller uh, capacities uh, to be put out for competitive bidding because if we ask for 100 megawatt, possibly it is too large for a Sri Lankan investor. And we have a large renewable energy investor community. We should not forget them. Uh, they have made money through renewable energy or through other mechanisms. So, so the project that we put out for bidding should be, should be manageable, uh, at least for a few of our uh, renewable energy investors. So given that fact, as well as uh, as, a, as a support to manage intermittency, I would also suggest that we do not make solar parks very large, but manageable in the capacity of 10 to 25 megawatt range. Uh, I look in a little differently. Of course, we should have most of our solar development uh, as distributed generation, maybe 10, 20 megawatts. But while doing that, no harm having a 100 megawatt, couple of 100 megawatt power plants where we have land and we are the cloud cover flow, because uh, a 100 megawatt power plant may bring in uh, you, uh, this economy of scale to such an extent that the prices will be quite low. We have seen that in Dubai, we have seen that in India, there are very low bidding prices for 100 megawatt, 100 to 500 megawatt kind of plants. But I don't agree with the 500 megawatt power plant in Sri Lanka because our network restrictions and capacities, but maybe a 100 megawatt power plant, <coughs> even even that may be in the same proximity, maybe 25 into four, as uh, 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 Dr. Simla Pitya said, so that four, <coughs> four uh, investors can do it, but using the common transmission infrastructure, so that the, the economy of scale will apply therein as well. So maybe a combination of that and also the intermittency issue by cloud cover can also be resolved to some extent by having them a little apart, but it's still connected to the same substation, common substation where the voltages will be raised to 32 kV or 220 kV at a common place. So a combination, a hybrid model kind of a thing, so that to get the, the economy of scale, because we know that rooftops are the best in that angle, because the, when a cloud moves, it moves gradually over the roofs, so that when one set of houses are covered, other set is released, so that the, the, the impact of inter intermittency is less. But you know when the problem is for every five kilowatt household unit or ten kilowatt household unit, we need a separate inverter and so on. So the economy of the scale doesn't come in that way, in my belief. So maybe while doing distributed ones, a couple of hundred megawatt scale ones will not do any much harm. And but let us look at the prices too, how they are beneficial. Mm -hmm.